I fucking love podcasting, man. Look at you, me, nude from the waist down. I didn't know there was a video. I would have that- brushed my hair. No, you don't have to brush your hair. You're too lovely. In fairness, you could just rock up. You're one of those fuckers who can just rock up on messy hair and go, this is how, you know, no no big deal, guys. You'd think that if you saw me in New York City mid-quarantine, uh, I, I fit in. <laughs> African-American neighborhood I was living in due to the nature and texture of my hair, uh, I had the world's greatest fro. <laughs> And for years, people say, you should just let it go natural. And And then then I saw myself in like July in New York when I I hadn't been to a hair stylist. (laughs) I looked insane. But in all fairness, everybody, like you're talking about fucking hair, Dara. I've I've ended up with a mullet. Now, to be Mm -hmm. fair, it is intentional. So this video is on Patreon, okay? If you're not on Tom's Patreon, you can't see this like... It is, I don't know if it's a fisheye lens. The setup here, it can't be a webcam. It's high def. You look, it looks like you've got Botox. You've got a, a handlebar mustache that looks like it's been Hulk Hogan at the tips. Yeah. It's either bleach or you're gone gray. Great. And you've got a mullet. Yeah. 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 Oh, it's a transform. I mean, they talk about transformations. This is, I've just slipped into what I'm supposed to be, really. Just a, a bloke with a handlebar mustache and a mullet. Man, living you look the- fucking great, man. <laughs> you didn't look great the first time I was on this podcast, which was in 1994. But now, <laughs> it's yeah, I think I, I, I think quarantine and, and lockdown has probably suited me somewhat. I've been eating a lot more. Uh, uh, native meats i've yeah. been hunting a bit more and still yeah hunting. yeah you still do that yeah 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 and w- w- well w- i don't know was it part in ireland did they was it part of any what what did they have fit levels was it part of a level three hunting is allowed <laughs> no i listened it was they, it never came into play it never came into play once you could stay inside you know uh Two kilometers of your zone, which right, yeah, two kilometers is fine when you're in Wakelow. There's deer hey. practically walking up to the window. I'd say, and I couldn't do it myself, Tom, but I would say the least likely environment for one to catch COVID 19 <laughs> or pass COVID 19 onto another person would be hiding in a bush in camouflage with a shotgun on for four hours by yourself. That's the, the whole idea of being is that you're actually just avoiding. And if, you, if you're if you avoiding coronavirus and if by chance you manage to snag a deer, then you, yeah, you know. What is that? Venison is, the, is what they call it. Yeah, venison. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, the, it's the king of all meats. It's the absolute daddy. I don't think I've ever had it. Is it nice to eat? What's, what is to the layman who shops in Aldi? Is it steak? Like, you know, I am from South Dublin, so I have eaten duck. Uh, and you would think a duck is like a chicken, but it's not like a chicken because it's brown. Uh, what is venison like a steak? It's a steak crossed with a chi- with a duck. That's uh, roughly what it is. It's lighter on the. It's much easier to chew because there's next to no fat and it's much more tender. But oh, it's geez. it's got a ducky vibe to it in that they're all out munching the same stuff. Basically, they're out gamey, just hanging out, just munching the same, pretty much the same things. And then they're, in terms of like protein. Or nutrients. What do you is is there a difference between that and what you're getting from a, from the cat? You're getting way more from uh, they, like the the rule of thumb is normally if the animal is fairly active and jumpy, then you'll get good energy from it because as a result, you know you're basically eating what they've been eating. But like cows just meander around, just arson all day. Oh man, b- barely, barely. Like you could you beep the horn driving past the field, and you might get two. Chaos looking up at you. They're so disinterested. It's not yeah. even fucking funny. Like they just meander and just arse about. Whereas deer are all the time like, hey man, I, uh, is, is there a party on? What, what are we doing? What sketch? Do you know? Yeah. So they're all the time amped up. So there's next to no fat in it. The protein levels are through the fucking roof. Um, and yeah, it's just it's just lovely. It's just lovely because I'm surprised it's not sold more. It to, is. You to, go to, go like, into Aldi. No, go but into Aldi. like pitched at these. TikTokers who are all on steroids. 
I don't know why it's not. I, I don't know. I guess it's not commercial. There's nobody, like, it's not commercially driven like beef is here. Like, you know what I mean? There's very few people are farming deer. The only people that are acquiring deer are blokes like me that go out and actually don't, go and find it. Don't they have to cull deer in yeah. Phoenix Park? Is yeah. Is that I, for food then? I presume. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're sold back through a co- handful of companies. Like, there's one, the Irish Game Company. And they are, they're the ones who produce it for the likes of Aldi and they produce it. They're, it's in Aldi and it's in it's in most places. Like there's a load of them in South Dublin now. It's becoming very big in South Dublin with uh, Boucher's, you know. This funny thing, it is, I've heard this said before from people that hunt. Uh, you see, like, you know, I'm, I'm a hypocrite, you know. And, yeah, I know uh, that. <laughs> I'm in, like an ambassador of sorts for the DSPCA and I've, which is the, the Dublin Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals. Absolutely. But I do eat meat. Now, um, it's like humans, like hunting and eating is human nature, you know, mm-hmm. how the world works. And, you know, so uh, they say that if you eat meat, you, you, sh- you should be able to go and hunt yourself kill the animal because you will have a lot more respect for the true that's what mm-hmm. they say you're supposed to be able to do but if you ask me to i don't know if the word is execute a cow for this murder thing, murder murder whatever i couldn't do it man it would haunt me and i i'd be like i'd be thinking about it for 15 years with the, oh you I, I promise you would i've been there at the killing point of 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 cattle in factories and i've seen them done halal with a sword oh, i've seen no. them done what yeah is- and honestly it will haunt it will haunt you but like honestly there's, there's, i would be a big advocate of uh um the dsbca because you're you're taking out a very happy animal in the less than a tenth of a second Who halal didn't- is like where you, you have to let yeah no i don't like that yeah, no, it's it's rough. It's rough, but an awful lot of our our meats here are sold to the Middle East, and that's they come with their sacred sword, and they, yeah, yeah. it's you know well, the the world is cruel anyway. But like this yeah. is all this has opened up lovely, hasn't it? It's, you're very welcome to the podcast, Ara Quilty. When does the podcast start anyway? <laughs> Fuck all that's good. That's good stuff. That's all going in. Are you joking me? <laughs> yeah, no, I couldn't do it, man. I couldn't. I couldn't. Most people uh, couldn't. Most people, and the first couple of times I, the first couple of times I did it too, it, it was a total shock to the system. One minute you're seeing this bouncy, lovely thing walking around, and the next thing, you've just, you know, blown a hole through its chest, like, and it's no, not. Deers have been in Disney. There's no Disney cow, like. Uh, yeah, I guess not. But they're still adorable. Have you seen the eyelashes on a cow? They're oh, gorgeous. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're... Don't look directly at a cow; they will mesmerize you. You might end up just shifting the face of a cow before you know it. Like, and there are all these weird artists. Like, firstly, let me just go on the record here. I don't get art. Okay, when I say art, I mean like the painting thing. Yeah, because technically we are supposed to be artists. You know, technically. Yeah, a podcast. <laughs> comedy music you know it, i guess it's all part of performing art but i'm talking about literally art and you, yeah i don't like the word or the phrase as an artist and this is a thing that i'm very <laughs> uncomfortable and uh i did uh two years ago probably uh hot press magazine remember magazines from the 80s remember oh those? yeah 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 like posters and shit like ryan Giggs and stuff like that yeah i remember hot yeah press- uh, our um, Hot Press are uh, a great supporter of Irish artists and independent music. And it's been, it's kind of, it's kind of been like the nucleus of Irish music for years and years. And I presume the magazine is actually struggling because who the fuck buys magazines now, you know? Um, and I remember doing this thing like the Christmas round table, it was called. And it was, uh, they get a bunch of people who are doing stuff. And uh, Stuart Clark is there. Oh, yeah. He kind of moderates this conversation. And Stuart Clark is one of the most interesting, nicest, interested in you. Like, he's a great journalist, a great music writer and a lover of music. So he sort of moderates this discussion. And there is all sorts of people there. Uh, Jerry Fish was there. He, he was amazing. He was, I, n- I had never actually sat and talked with Jerry Fish before. And then there were a couple of other folks there, some younger ones. And um, it's funny 
the lower you go down in age, the more arrogance there was. <laughs> and somebody at the table was uh, talking about songwriting. And you see, the thing about songwriting, Tom, and I know that you're a big songwriter. Yes. Um, there is an artist and there is a songwriter, and they're two very different things. Elvis Presley was an artist, but Elvis Presley never wrote any of his own music. Yeah. Right? Uh, Elton John, he never wrote any of his lyrics. So there's, and that's, and that's okay, because he has his uh, partner, uh, not his husband, but he has his writing partner, who writes Elton's lyrics, because he's mm. a musician who writes the songs, melody. So, you know, he'd have da na 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 da 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 then your man writes you know whatever <laughs> so <laughs> songwriting is complicated and i know people who write songs for bands and then the people in the bands try to pretend they wrote the song themselves but they're very different crafts songwriting and producing is very different to being an artist some of the great songwriters couldn't be artists because yeah. you, need, you need to have the pizzazz uh there's no secret ingredient to it really it's kind of uh, I guess the formula is, um, I think, luck and timing are, are yeah. the biggest factors in it. But um, somebody at this table who definitely doesn't write songs was saying, uh, you know, as an artist, <laughs> I found it difficult when I hand my work over because a producer makes the music, which is fine, by the way. It's fine that a producer yeah. makes music, you know, because it's, it's very precious to me. And as, and this person kept saying as an artist, as that's an making artist. my skin crawl. I, every time you fucking say that I left that and I had to call my drummer, Ronan Nolan, who's like the funniest fucker ever. And I, like, he gets it. Like, and I was like, I need to just go through. I've what's happened to me for the last 20 minutes, <laughs> you know, just this, I, and I think it's uh, like moving to New York. I think it's an Irish thing. Is it? I, I just being confident in yourself to say, I make podcasts. I'm a comedian. I'm an artist. Well, I would have never considered that because I thought we were a bit like, uh, sure, I'm grand. But then maybe that's just no, my I'm upbringing. An Irish thing to detest, detest. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I, yeah, no, you are. And I, I, but there's a, in the back of your mind, I think there's always one of your mates should always be in the back in here, drilled into this about 45 degrees back to the back of your head, going. Shut up, you fucking eat it. Just to keep you some way online. There has I, to be. And I have one. Have you? Yeah, of course I do. He's great. And he, I, won't, I won't say his name. He listens to all of my podcasts. And he's... Uh, <clears throat> sorry, I have coronavirus. Oh, he's cool. Uh, he, uh, I did a podcast episode with a guy called Hugh Cooney, who I love. He's oh, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Hugh, he was... Uh, is he from... Where is he from? What? No. No, he's, I think he's a Dublin guy, but he was like the he was putting videos on the YouTubes like 14 years ago. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He had and there were weird kind of sketches and stuff like yeah. that. Like he did cool, cool guy one where he was cycling or so. Yeah, I remember. I remember it. So I'm like, he's a bit older than me, but I remember being in like school and watching Hugh Cooney online and like being a massive fan of Jackass. Yeah. The Tom Green show and that world of quirkiness to see an Irish guy being like. You, you know quirky so i had hugh on my podcast because he was la he's launching this whole new thing called folklore which is very interesting and i have the guy and this is the voice note that he sent my friend sent to me <laughs> who listens to every podcast and he sends me this hey man just listen to that hugh cooney podcast it's probably one of the most bizarre things i've ever listened to uh, very good, but I've absolutely no idea what's going on. <laughs> Perfect. Perfect. Can you, can you, there, uh, there wasn't one compliment in that whole note. Not one. No. I listened to it, and that's enough. The fact that your mate listened to it is enough to say, well done. I, I, you know, I appreciate you. I trust that you are a good broadcaster. But at no point did he go, class, great no, he's job. Great. No, he does, he does compliment me. But then, like, when I put something up, like, he's on me, like, as if he's my producer. I put up some something on Instagram with a squeaky voice. I don't know, one of these new fucking filters. And yeah. uh, I put up some shit, probably. And he wrote back immediately, you've fucking lost it, mate. And I wrote back saying, 
or I found it. And he wrote back saying, I can confirm this is shite content. <laughs> straight, straight away. That's the same guy. You but have I to keep that. you grounded. I fucking love it, man. Yeah. All my friends, all of them, none of my, uh, as I call them, home friends, uh, work in, in, in this business. Yeah, most of my friends still work in construction and stuff like that. So they're going, what? What's, yeah. What? The, what? They're the best. And, yeah. and it's also... I actually talked to this guy about what he'd like to hear on the show or what he doesn't like to hear on the show because he's the kind of person that's going to fucking listen to this. Yeah. Show. Yeah. So he's yeah. Incredibly valuable. Yeah. And but when it's good. He'll say, oh man, that was fucking, he's listening to this. No doubt right now. Yeah. 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 Well, there's the thing is that there's always going to be people in uh, like you can, you lose that mistake, especially doing comedy is that for the first couple of years and talk to loads of comedians, they make the mistake of thinking that it's for them. You're on stage. It's, it's me. I'm, I'm class. I'm class. And unfortunately, every so often, there'll be a few slip through the cracks who by hook or by crook or by some weird timing, they end up making it and making a profession out of it and have never been pulled up on that point that, hold on, it's not at all about you. It's about the fuckers buying the tickets in the room. You know? Yeah, there is an element, though, of that, I think, in a sense that if if you are authentic, I've, uh, now that I'm in my late 40s, I've come to her... <laughs> You know, as I've gotten older, how important authenticity is. Because if you go back to what I was saying earlier on about the, as an artist, yeah, if you take Billie Eilish, who, you know, undisputably is probably the biggest emerging pop star of the last two, three years. Yeah. Yeah. Right? yeah. Uh, for some reason, there always seems to be one female artist who's the biggest in the world you know before billy eilish it was the illuminati they have they have a they, yeah. they, they allow one through strange thing yeah but if i took billy eilish and i played you that first song the one that's like and then i showed you the picture of her with the 1990s illuminous green baggy pants boots half of the hair dyed green half dyed black and i said what do you think of this one you would say because you'd look at Taylor Swift and you'd be like, this girl's not going to yeah. make it at all here. Yeah. But because she is unique and authentic, she fucking powerhouses to the top. And that's impossible to do. Even like she comes from a family of the show business and her brother writes the songs and all this. But you can't force organic connection with an audience it's fucking impossible and i know of bands and artists who have all the connections in the world and they get handed the big gigs and oh you can open for so and so here yeah or you can do this or here's a hundred grand go and record this album and sure the shit will sound good the instagram will look good but you can't force an organic connection and the same thing applies to comedy I suppose. I, I mean, it, yes, it is and it isn't to a certain degree because you're talking from a point of view of somebody who appreciates an, an organic connection. You have to remember there are people who like frozen things out of Iceland for Sunday dinner. There are people who like Michael McIntyre. There are people who like, they don't know they like it, but they go, I, well, Channel 4 has told me this is amazing. So I'm going to sit here on this and eat my TV microwave dinner and fucking lovely. I love this shit. And I will pay 80 or 90 quid to see one of these beige artists the next time they, you know, they don't want to make that connection that you're talking about because they're going, why the fuck would I engage that much? I haven't slipped they into are, second gear in my, in my, at all. In my rhythm. You, is it the algorithm? They like Michael McIntyre. Now I don't like Michael McIntyre as a comedian. Uh, I saw one funny joke he did about Brits on holidays. I thought that was good, but he's not for me, but just because I like Mark Normand and Joe list mm. from the cellar doesn't mean that, it's not okay for, you know, my friend Mark to enjoy Michael McIntyre because Michael McIntyre is like mass appeal. Yeah. He's the family friendly comedian. So like, I think sometimes when you're in it and you're so judgmental and always looking around, you forget that there's room for that also because if you like Michael McIntyre, you're not going to like Bill Burr. It's not. Happening. Yeah, yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's that's like my my, my point is that just picking McIntyre is that some people don't want that 
you know, as you talk about organic field, they just, just give me the, just give me the goo. I just need the goo just to cover my brain for a Saturday evening. You know, they don't want to have to dig deep into a situation, but you're right. Like Billie Eilish, Jesus Christ. I mean, who would have seen that? You know, but I think you're saying, oh, who's the next Billie Eilish? I'm like, no, this isn't the fucking question, man. But the X Factor has done that. You know what I mean? They're going, who is the next? You know what I mean? X Factor and is incorrect. Like, it's like there's X. Now we need to add a Y to Z, Uh, you know, and even as a kid, man, I was emulating bands or doing radio or TV, emulating people that I looked up to. Until like, again, I told you, I was like, oh, actually, fuck it. I'm just going to be myself over yeah. here. Yeah, brilliant. At any point, though, did you want to ever go that, partridge? Started, started working. Uh, do you know what? I'd love to see you going partridge someday. Just just going, oh, just just take it. You should, that that would be an amazing, like Sunday morning, fucking Dara reads the newspapers. Do you remember those newspapers that used to be out back in the 70s? Just Dara reads it, but giving it, giving it full you know t- skirting around the edges of possibly you know racism you know and all the rest and just being dara if he was born maybe 50 years previous but the thing about what when i was you know i decided to finish in radio in ireland uh because i you know i was it was the time it was kind of an it was like really now or never sort of situation i'd always wanted to move to america and you know i got getting i was tipping on you know i turned 30 you know Jeez. Oh, gee, you're fucking ancient. You're yeah. ancient. How really? would you have ever get gotten those years back? But you, I, I remember that move happened. I was kind of going, should I fucking play? Because you left when you're hot, like you know what I mean. But that's the right time to leave too, like you know when you're you're still swinging for the fences. Because if you left and you're, it wasn't even calculated in that way. Like I really enjoyed that show, and that show did really fucking well. Yeah, I worked really hard on that fucking show, also at the same time. Um. Because it, w- it was on a station that was struggling in terms of ratings. And that's all that matters, evidently, mm. in the world is ratings. And um, uh, it w- on that show, though, because I had made it, I was able to t- do those stupid things that you either got or you, or you did. And so I would play like an obnoxious dance song. <laughs> Come off the back of the song. No, the RFM, that a quilty big Roy at home, text was and like music going up and they're always seven, seven, 98, 98, 98. Shout out to Tommy, El Hunt. Hope you got a few bullets, Tommy. And I do the whole link like that and then go into another song. Now, to the people who listen to the show, they know that's me taking the piss, but there's Good. some guy who's just randomly flicking around who's come across the radio station and doesn't know because nobody knows people on the radio. Let's be fucking honest here. Yeah. And, Here's some lad on 98 FM <laughs> going 0877 98 98 98. Good afternoon, and thinks it's a real thing happening. Like you sound like you know, some uh, from from the garden shed. This is Pills FM. Keep yeah. it going. Whoop, whoop. Hip, the, yeah, the pirate piss take. I love, yeah. the, I love the pirate radio DJ idea. So I kind of got away with doing that kind of stuff. Uh, because the station uh, were like, yeah, you do whatever you want. Just So you're flying it. You're absolutely flying it. And the next thing you go, uh, P45, please, uh, I'm away. Like how? Yeah, well, I, I know, honestly, I had a, a, a very good, that's in my WhatsApp. Please put your phone on silent in the broadcast. Thank you. I had a very good relationship with the uh, program uh, director. And he was the person that offered me the show. The short version of the story is it was presented by two guys, Dermot and Dave, who were the golden boys of that radio station. Um, Tony Fenton, um, Lord rest him. He was sick and they were to move to Today FM and it was all part of this grand plan. But Tony got his disease accelerated. So they got moved quicker than planned. And then I got called into an office. I think I was 25 turning 26 or 26 ish. Yeah, five years. Yeah, it would have been 25, 26. And he said, uh, you know, clo- close the door. Jesus. I was like, okay. Zip. <laughs> and he goes down. Everybody, every single person that has listened to this podcast, that's exactly what they thought. It's go time. So he goes, German uh, and Dave, are you interested? It's like, yeah, yeah, I like their show. Yeah, why? What about them? It's like, no, they're moving to Today FM. 
do you want the gig? And I did not see it coming. Like I didn't see 98 FM on my horizons. I was on spin. I was doing the zoo crew hot 30, Brian and Dara text it now. And <laughs> I remember it. Grown were- up, you know? it's grown up. It's for grown ups. And I was like, fuck, but they have money at the same time. I'm like, Oh, holy hell. And I was kind of prepared. I was going to go to America then, but pre, because Brian had left the show and I was oh, like, shit, oh, right. This is my head, man. I wasn't actually going to do it because I'm a procrastinator. But, you yeah. know, in my head, I was like, all right, I, Brian's taking a break. I'll take a break and I'll go off and be a rock star and Jimmy Kimmel and all, all at the same time. And um, the offer was there. And I was like, holy fuck, are you sure? And he was like, yeah. And then obviously, Above him, there's a manager who going, well, Quilty is an eighth of the price of Dermot Dayton. <laughs> so let's get him in. So they brought me in. They let me name the show. They let me do the clocks of the show, which is how radio, how, like how the hour works. Very boring, but there's news. It has to happen at that time. How many songs? Ad break and come up with these games. It was really, really, it was very creatively satisfying because... <laughs> Because I had this pre-established relationship with the program director who was the guy who put Brian and Dara together on the zoo. So, you know, you know, we're just he's he he's a great broadcasting mind and we clicked. So he knew if he offered me that gig, he could trust me with it. We worked on it together. It was great. But I had told him uh, that when I'm out, I'll tell you. OK, you know. So I was able to go to him and uh, I was dating somebody that was living in New York. I was doing long distance and uh, he was like, are you, are you moving? I was like, no, not yet. Not yet. I will be, but uh, I'll, I promise I will tell you. So I told him well, well in advance, sort of as a courtesy. Yeah. Cause I was with the company for so fucking long. Um, so they, it wasn't like, hell yeah, I'm gone four weeks notice which was on the contract or whatever so i kind of gave them enough time uh you know to make their decisions and their plans and uh and it also you have to put together a portfolio to move to the united states jesus christ they get the visa oh shit right yeah 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 oh man so what 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 do you put yourself down like did you have to give your last five years in radio Wait, like, I have it here. Pictures uh, of you, I'm you in, sorry, in, I'm in Ireland, by the way, I'm back. I'm not in New York. I'm back for the, for, for the Crimbus. Christ. So there it is. I actually have the, the thing. This took me. It's a physical portfolio. Like you're a model or something. Oh yeah. Yeah. So I, 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 I <laughs> full circle, baby. I'm on the artist visa. Okay, right. For anybody wondering here, it is a. It looks initially like something you would see. Look how thick that is. That is the thesis. That is what I had to present. Are you on the front cover as well, man? It's my fucking. That is amazing. I swear to God, if you're not a Patreon right now, go over just for this moment. Go over, pay your three dollars, and get it. Become a Patreon just to see. Dara's portfolio of himself. 101 pages long. <laughs> and it's like every single thing I ever did, like like that kind of shit had to be in it. Oh my fucking God. Actual physical pictures. Like I... You can Google cri- the, cri- so the, the criteria for the... Sorry, put this away. Uh, firstly, I don't come from... A, uh, I love my family and we're great, but like my parents aren't the parents who are like... Oh, he's in the newspaper let's put it in the box I've never yeah seen. yeah yeah so uh i had to it, it took about a year i think to put the, this fucking book together because that's the what you have to present to the government and then they decide in like 10 seconds whether or not hold on so what's the process do you go up to the king of america basically so and he's sitting at his throne and you bow down before him and you place yeah. that folder at his feet and somebody thumps- a, a call straight away no i uh, anyone doing it uh, I would recommend uh, going through a lawyer. And if somebody's listening and wants to do it, I have a guy for you. Uh, so you can reach out to me directly if you want. I went uh, through a lawyer and it's a whole process. Uh, it's, it's a two-step, two-step process. Uh, firstly, um, there's many different visas that exist. I mean, we all know what the J-1 is. Yeah. So the J-1 is the visa where you can go on your... It's 90 days for the summer. San Diego, I- four months. 
four month visa, San Diego, sleep all day, drink all night, blah, blah, blah. And then they have now the J1 extended program, which is for if you graduate with a degree, you can get a J1, which allows you to live and work in the United States for 12 months, but you're limited in where you can work, you know? Okay, you yeah. You can't work for Google uh, on a J1. So then if you work for Google, because they're a multinational company, you can say, hi, boss. Well, Dara, I want to be transferred to the San Francisco office. And then Google then put everything into place for you. And then you will get an L1 visa and you'll be permitted to be in the United States for five years, but you can work for Google and only Google. Then below an L1 visa, I think there's a thing called a H1B, which is a similar kind of thing where the, a company, Amazon, Facebook, Twitter, Dropbox, Google, OnlyFans, YouPorn, whatever you're doing. The good stuff. And, and they can transfer you. So a lot of people do that. And a lot of my friends do that. And that's great. But I don't work for a multinational. You work for you. So uh, I had to, uh, uh, this lawyer I had is so good, so helpful. And essentially it's the two-step, pro- you, they, you put, firstly, he decides whether or not you, you can meet the criteria. Okay. So if he says no, you're not going to do it. So the number one criteria on the thing is awards. Um. And they have, e.g., Grammys and Oscars. <laughs> it's like, what about PPI and Imro Radio Award? So uh, they were the fucking big seller. Were they? Yeah, man. Like Jesus, right? That was like in my head when I was entering the Imros. I was like, I have to win this for the visa. <laughs> fucking. Uh, yeah, number. I think if you Google O one criteria, I think it's accolades within your field. I think it's number one. Uh, and that's like literally on page two there. It's like a list of of those. Then there's other shit like you must be a member of blah, blah, blah society in your thing, you know. Like is, if is there a, a secret society of radio hosts? No, if you're in a band, you'll be a member of IMRO. Okay. It's also sponsored the radio awards, but IMRO is the Irish music rights organization. And then there's PPI, which is phonographic performance art. And so they're like, they're not unions, but you, you know, you're a member. Yes, of yeah, thing. yeah. They have, you have a certificate and they hang on it. And you go, you know, you meet them on a Tuesday and you drink Kool Aid or whatever. Um, so there's all these things. And then you must be published and magazines, newspapers, all this shit. So they have their list. So I have to go like Googling myself for six months, tracing back as far as I could go. You wow know, what a weird moment like to be oh so weird man it's nice to have it now because it's like you know this is your life kind of thing and then it goes to uh U- uscis united states citizen immigration services so they decide whether or not you are entitled to an interview and that happens in vermont so they pass you and then you've got to go into the embassy in dublin for your interview oh jesus right and that is fucking five minutes long tops and that guy says yeah no i so, ima- I just imagine them actually testing you out as a radio dj in there like put on the headphones sh- there dara into the fake microphone and give us five your best i was shitting it i have my portfolios it is way too much stuff in the portfolio my lawyer told me he said so there was an interesting thing that they did with the oh one they vetoed social media in the last two or three years because apparently, this is my lawyer told me, like Instagrammers and influencers were going and getting these O1 visas. Oh shit! Right? Yeah, yeah. But they're not for like. It's, let's let's say you're a Tom the actor and you're savage. If you want to go to Hollywood, you might not have five hundred thousand Instagram followers, but you can go and buy them. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. I thought like, oh shit, I better get verified on fucking Instagram and Facebook and have it all like pristine. You know what I mean? Every Everything I did for the last two years was visa, 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 visa. And I remember saying to him, I was like, oh, hey, they, they blue tick the Instagram or whatever. And he was like, oh yeah, it doesn't matter. They dismissed all social media. I was like, what? <laughs> Why? <laughs> he sent my fucking passport into fucking Facebook. And he was like, he said, because influencers were coming on fake deals. So they they made they which is good I guess for because the visa is for 
an O1 is for somebody working in sciences, like if you're like, a, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Pfizer vaccine. When you're, are you beneficial to the fucking country you're going to, I suppose, is the, the overall. Or if you're an actor, a musician, a comedian, a dancer, whatever, you know, that you have a unique skill that an American doesn't, basically, is the, okay. is the idea. So um, the lawyer said to me, he's like, it's funny. He was like, I have so many clients that want O1s who absolutely don't deserve them that are twice as cocky as you. He's like, you're going to sail this. And I was like, man, is there enough stuff? Oh, Jesus Christ, what happens if he says no? Like, fuck. I went in for the interview in the embassy. Uh, guy who interviewed me was about 27. You know, <laughs> he did. <laughs> wearing his dad's shirt, a pair of glasses, black curly hair. And he was like, hey. I was like, <laughs> slid the book. He was like, oh, what do you do? I was like, uh, a musician broadcasting. He was like, oh, well, it's like, what have you been doing lately? It's like, I've been hosting a drive time show on 98 FM. He's like, ah, pretty cool. It's like, would you like to see my portfolio? My portfolio? He's like, yeah. So I'm like sliding it under. It's like a tap <laughs> in the embassy sliding under the thing. He literally opens it up, looks at the page with the, I can show it to you. If I, actually, fuck it, it doesn't matter. There's an, where I list all the awards. Yeah. There's like a picture of me with the mum. <laughs> he looked at that page, looked at me and went, wow, that sure is you. And literally goes, Flick through the whole book, <laughs> and that was it. Good and that was thanks. fucking eight months of my life for that flick, and then I got the fucking visa. Well, you had like the, the thing is, I mean, had there been any, had you put in no work whatsoever, and the chances are because you know you didn't have the social media to back you up or anything at that stage, so you would have, you could have caught somebody in a bad fucking mood too. It's it's luck and timing that's too. Like there is a thing called request for further evidence that can happen, and that's okay, where they need more evidence. Yeah, which is fine, you know. So uh, yeah, I guess I was lucky and. I did it. And the good thing about having the visa is they're kind of, you can continuously re renew them with it. You don't have to go. I don't have to do that whole thing again. But you get over there and like crafty is just straight out. Like the amount of lads that seem to be arsing about when they go to New York for the first while, like you seem to be straight into work. Had you stuff lined, you, you had stuff that you see, you're, you make yourself out to be like, a, ah, you know, I just float with the wind and whatever happens. <laughs> you cute her, like you land over there and all of a sudden Dara's <laughs> like, Okay, Darius. Now he's he's doing he's 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 on MTV. He's <laughs> he's Mr. MTV now. Right. Okay. Is there nothing this whore can't do? Like, no, I'm not. Like, I'm I'm not working. I'm contracting. I'm a what is it? A contractor. We're all contractors, Dara. We're all contractors. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I've been doing bits. So I'm yet to get my own show. Uh, and what I was most amazed by was. It's not as different as Ireland. Right. People are willing to help. Okay. And they're also willing to help without this weird looking over the shoulder thing. Like, I love the fact that I, I can be on your podcast and then in 2021, I can say, oh, Tom, come on my podcast. Promote yeah. That doesn't exist in radio or TV. I suppose it doesn't. Yeah, it doesn't. You're dead right. Yeah, that's a really valid point, like where you can actually... Or, there are no more radio stations. Even with my band releasing music, there is like three radio groups in Ireland. And because I work for one, the other two won't play. The, you know, you know. so it's kind of like people are like, he's got an advantage. I'm like, no. FM 104 would never play an Appella song because I work for 98 FM. Wow. Jesus Christ. Is that like just as cutthroat as that? So you've got a cut working for 98 FM. And it's not like maybe the, actually the song was just too shit for FM. <laughs> <laughs> no issue with FM 104. I have no issue with any radio station in Ireland whatsoever. And anyone in radio that has an ego is my favorite thing in the world. When the ego in the radio, especially in Dublin, because all you need to do is drive 100 miles west and you and your existence is yeah when the station runs out you know so um i was uh what i found most interesting the first uh i did something for mtv it was uh 99 questions or something like this okay and they had like all these famous people on it 
but you know they couldn't find enough people for each episode so i was asked to go in and just like answer some questions on camera i was like uh, yeah absolutely obviously so it was like you know who was your first crush so i answered these fucking 12 questions and um i think trl was on at the time was filmed in the studio and that was really fun i think i made it into these were all shorts yeah but it was really weird it was like zara larson going my worst habit is me creaking my my neck like cracking my bones and then it comes to me going you ever fart in bed and go <laughs> and, and that, that made it on and i'm like i'm between zara larson and ed sheeran but like there were also other miscellaneous people in it but whatever so that was really cool and then the first show was a show called MTV's Made the Best Twin Win. And they made the show um, without intention for host. Okay. So it was a dating show that they made. Uh, kind of a fun idea where it's like, you know, and Americans, they, they're all so good on television. Like they're all born. Unbelievable. Media trained. Unbelievable. Like you watch it, like even a house building program here and everybody's kind of going, well, sure. Like, I mean, we're no, we hope we get a And you watch a house building program in America and they all just, da -da. well, of course, we're delighted to have our contractor on board. You're like, how the fuck? You can't, what? It's something else, isn't it really? Unbelievable. So this show was the idea. So it was like, you know, they up the contestants or whatever signed up. So you got the guy sitting at the table and they've made a set, you know, and his date appears and sits down. And he's like, oh, hey, I'm Corey. I am Chantel. And then next minute, Chantel's identical twin walks out. But our friend Corey has no idea there's twins. Okay, right, right. This sounds that, some, yeah. That's the angle. Right. And then yeah. it's like they're competing to win the guy. It's kind of, kind of silly, you know, it's kind of it was supposed to be a silly show. And like, I think one time there was... The twins came out and it was like, oh, my God, you're twins. And then a fucking triplet walked out as well. You know, nice. I think the idea was that we'll, we'll let like the magic happen. It'll be more reality TV. OK. Esque. So uh, they did it. And I don't think they were entirely happy with, you know, because like that takes a lot of producing. And then the producer needs to be able to stop the the flow and say can you say this can you say that which is very difficult to do right for yeah. a 20 minute show so they were they said maybe we'll put a voice over on it so but it, it, it works it always works it works so much better because people expect i know it's a great notion so often you would see these shows and it's a great idea oh this could be really funny but nine times out of ten your average joe or josephine regardless of how good they are in on, on, on camera ain't fucking funny you know what I mean? And oh, yeah, yeah. Tying it together was perfect for a moment for you to swoop in and go, by the way, I can make yeah. this schlick. <laughs> so they sent me episode one and I just sort of, again, like this is why it's like, it's like Ireland. I was like, they were like, just here's the people. Just put something on top of this and we'll see. Yeah. And Brilliant. Like, what it's like here. I, I like, oh, really? Okay. So there was no scripting ahead. It was just like, Derek, could you sort this out, please? Just, no, can you just, as a thing, just say some funny shit here? And I was like, cool. So I did it. And then, of course, I have an Irish accent. And they're Ooh. like, oh, my God, this is like Love Island. Wow. Not realizing that Love Island is in the UK is hosted by a guy who lives in the UK. Yes. Uh, what's his name? Ian, Ian Sterling. Yeah, 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 yeah. Tremendous voiceover. Really, really funny. And then everyone tries to copy him, you know. And this is another thing. Be yourself, you son of a bitch. Yeah. Because of the accent, they were like, oh, this is cool. So they were like, yeah, great. Let's do it. I'm like, fucking sweet. Let's Beautiful. do it. Beautiful. So and then there was a, more scripting from their end. Because usually with a VO, the show's made for VO. So you have dips in production. Yes. And you, you'll get a beep. And you'll say, you know. And then Tom murdered the deer. Yeah. <laughs> So there was none of that. So I kind of got to put in like little silly fucking jokes. Um, again, I'm not a comedian uh, and I'm not a comic writer. I don't think I'm a comedian. I can be a silly goose on a podcast or radio. That's yeah, yeah, yeah. That's I'm not like I'm not doing stand up. I don't want to do stand up. I fucking love stand up as an observer. And I'm down for having a silly time with comedians or hosting something and being a comedic relief. 
So that's what this was. And then uh, I think there was four or five episodes uh, of that show. And then it was put up online. So I was reading the comments and like nobody commented on the accent. Really? Really? Nobody. And I did. That's a good thing. Like, but I didn't change how I, I didn't change my accent. The only thing would have been like colloquialisms. Yeah. Like, uh, you know, Tuesday or sidewalk. He's made the best twin win premieres instead of premiere. Yeah. Yeah. Friday on YouTube instead of YouTube. <laughs> so there are certain things <laughs> I, I call it in my mind. I'm like, all right, you're here. You are. You're a young Craig Ferguson. You're going to Craig Ferguson. this. Yeah. Oh yeah. 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 Like where Craig Ferguson grew up, you would not understand him even in an English speaking fucking country. And you know, you wouldn't like where he grew up, not a fucking hope. You got to explain who Craig Ferguson is because people. Uh, Craig make- Ferguson is a, well, he has his own, his own talk show, but he's got that very nice soft. Uh, I'm from, uh, I'm from, I'm from Scotland, <laughs> which that accent doesn't actually exist in Scotland. That accent was created for people to understand Scottish people, but nobody, <laughs> That accent doesn't, as somebody who has, I, I've lived there for periods of my life, I can tell you here now, that accent doesn't actually exist. And it's Scottish people are impossible to understand. It's so difficult. It's, it, Scotland it's, and Northern Ireland for English speaking. It's like, I always thought Irish people spoke fast. Nice or, you to, or you go to Boston or New York. And they're like, you know, it is what it is. It is what it is. I walk in, he's over here. It is what it is. I, I was like, Scotland, man. Woo. Woo. Yeah. No, it's, it's, and, and the thing is that they, like, <laughs> I think they purposely bastardize words and they write phonetically even. It's amazing. They actually write phonetically exactly how they sound. They write, you could actually read somebody's tweets from Scotland and go and sound Scottish. Oh, they, they have a lot of like, um, I guess they're also, they're all, Here's me using the word twice, but their own colloquialisms, like their own. Like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And they don't give a, sh- shit. give a shit. It's get on board or. And as well as that, it's I think it's kind of a throwback to kind of Celtic because they do have they do have their own version of Scottish, too, that is spoken in certain parts. Like, but they don't give a bollocks. And same with the the real culture, Nordy lads as well. Like you get we were up at a wedding like I gigged there a lot. So I've kind of gotten used to it and a bit of an ear for it. But when you, <laughs> you meet lads who are like just down out of a fucking tractor who are up from up the north somewhere like and best of fucking luck best of luck because it's like but also really? the best crack oh yeah that's yeah. the thing that's the thing uh and i'm sure scotland is great crack as well I, I uh that's the thing like new york city and london or los angeles or wherever you want to live you show business wanker um who was I talking to about this recently? I can't remember, but the crack is so fucking specifically and uniquely Irish. And I'm wondering, is that because we are Irish? Oh, it was Jardeth Regan was who I was talking to because he's been in London. Yeah, years now. And he was like, because in New York, I mean, you know, the comedians over there, I love the New York comedy <laughs> circuit and i've been lucky enough to have pretty heavy players on my own show like mark norman and joe list like i've got to sit and do a podcast with those guys um and your friend tom green yeah 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 you know and if like i can do that anybody can do that is my is my point but um the the just i notice i will throw a line i will throw something that is sarcastic or too quick yeah and yeah, it's yeah. taken literally yeah but i won't correct it i'll let them go because they'll run with it another way yeah and you don't want to make an asshole of them but if there's a little bit of you just dies for a moment inside you're like ah oh, fuck that was yeah. yeah you don't and it's just yeah there is just even hanging out with american guys man they're like similar interest musicians or comics or whatever really great people really really nice but it, there's just that element of how far can I put even on this podcast? Yeah, I can't make fun of the Jews, just you know, because I, we get in trouble. Yeah, but every, I think everything's open season. I remember actually just, um, and it's not a name drop, but because it's somebody you would both know of, and he's a he would seem like a ball breaker. Is Bill Burr? I was drinking with Joe DeRosa 
at a festival a couple of years ago and Burr had just come off stage and he was kind of waspy about it because it was in a big tent and there was fucking light beaming in from the door. The Vodafone Comedy Festival? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Two shows back to back in the hottest room in the world. In the hottest room in the world. And they they were still, they didn't put a porch on the front of these giant tents. So every time you open up the July, the one, the two days of summer that we have in Dublin, the sun just came roaring through and like 2,000 people all at the same time. You immediately can't help it, but look away from the man who's on stage and they look at the door. It's just a natural thing when a door opens, everybody looks and he went, for the love of Christ, would somebody close the fucking door? It was, so he was a bit waspy over. Well, I've, I've interviewed him. He was great. I've never met him. So you've hung out. Go on, tell me. Oh, so it was just, he, um, so DeRosa and myself, because we'd been drinking the day before and we were back on it again. And we fucking started with whiskey, the bastard. And I can't, you know, I was trying to hold myself together, but he's a hardy fucker when it comes to drinking. And, but he got, he loved the vibe of like, every time somebody came, like came over that I knew, we were ripping into each other. It's like, oh, you can't, wait the fuck. Do you know that vibe? And he, DeRosa was just going, oh, Jesus Christ, this is exactly the kind of juice that fuck. I, you don't get enough of this on a communal scale. You'll get the odd person you know that can speak to each other like that. But he says, you've spoken to at least 15 people. He's an uh, East Coaster though, isn't he? DeRosa. Yeah. Yeah. And the next thing, Burr came in and he sat down. It was kind of funny to see people scurrying around. Now, I, even I was like, oh, Jesus Christ, Bill Burr, you know, but it was, it, there was people kind of scurrying back and forth. But he, DeRosa immediately said, he goes, man, we, we have to move to Ireland. The way he's been speaking to people and they've been speaking to him and just the ball breaking at levels we have, we wouldn't even fucking be able to keep up. And we were like, really? And it was just immediately started giving each other shit just for the fucking laugh. And then Burr started, he started just giving everybody shit like that was coming near us. It was very funny to see. So that's, I've heard about, I've know, I know people that have, have hung out with Bill Burr and there's a weird um, thread online uh, of people who have had Bill Burr on their podcasts uh, and like then go on to talk about the trauma afterwards because he's so iconic in comedy. And um, I think it's, there's a, uh, I only discovered this recently. There's two guys in New York that I, I'm enjoying at the moment. Uh, Chris DeStefano. And, oh, yeah. And Yanis Papas. Yeah. Uh, and they have this uh, uh, podcast called History Hyenas that is so fucking New York, but it's so funny. And Chris DeStefano looks like the biggest American douchebag jock ever, just like physically. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But he's so he's so not that, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, they had Bill Burr on, and and they were talking about this the whole thing on Reddit or something. I don't know about like there's a whole like post traumatic Burr disorder <laughs> thing going on. I was like, you know, because all the comments were like, Burr was at home with Giannis Papas and Chris Stefano because Burr's from Boston, yeah, and then yeah. moved to New York. And was a later addition to L.A. So by the time Bill Burr moved to L.A., he was like famous. Yes, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he had kind of, I suppose, done the groundwork in in, in New York where there's more stage time. So you could see Bill Burr like, yeah, like almost lost with Chris and Yanis because they're so fucking, they have so many insider fucking jokes. Mm. And uh, you can see like Theo Vaughn and your man from... There's, I think there's a, you, the YouTube's H3H. You know about these people? What? Like H3H. No, I have no idea what you're speaking about right now. It's something. And they're big. They were like, they were like YouTubers. Then they had a podcast. They got like millions of views. And Bill Burr, but the, your man that hosts it isn't like a comic. And Bill Burr went on and it was, it was just like, Oh, Wait, what bit, happened? It was just awkward. And I think, I, I, I think, I'm just, I can't remember the guy's name. Ethan something. It's Ethan Klein, maybe. Maybe he was just nervous and intimidated by, oh shit, it's Bill Burr. I better, yeah. you know. And then uh, there was this whole thing about Bill Burr and Theo Vaughn. Oh my God. I oh. saw that podcast. And it, this is, this is my take on that. There was, um, Especially in America, it's very much earn your fucking stripes and you're nobody till you've earned your stripes. And it's kind of, 
it's not so much here anymore. Like it's not so much here anymore because people come with Instagram game now, unfortunately, and they come with, they are a package that a uh, promoters are looking for. So they all they immediately, their ego jumps up and you're going, hold on, you jumped three years here and you definitely do not have the talent to do that. But all right. But it is very much that in old school American stand up that you t- like t- Vaughn has done nothing, done fucking nothing. And Burr would speak to everybody at that fucking level. Like he was trying to, like he was, he had a waspy edge in him, but I, I had so much whiskey on board. I didn't give a fuck if it was Bill Burr or fucking Bill, my father. I, myself and DeRosa were having our own crack. But so he kind of. This is what I, I was getting to is what I know of people that have hung out with him. He hates the fucking fanboy. He yeah. fucking, it, he hates it. He wants to be with a lad who, like sports yeah he yeah, doesn't want any fucking nonsense oh god bill oh you're so inspiring do you have any tips for me because i want to do he, he he wants exactly what you're well i i wanted to fight him just for a mess fight like i can remember just i was a being an annoying bastard myself and derosa we were going to arm wrestle and stuff just being fucking pains in the hole like but he could see he was laughing kind of with kind of, god you're such fucking meatheads the two of you i've landed on the two of your arm wrestling Look at you fucking assholes. Like, and I was going, what come on, Bill, I'll fucking fight you. But I remember talking about cars with him. That was that was a moment because at the time I was doing a kind of a weird kind of side gig where I was teaching people how to drive Ferraris. And that was it. I remember he just wanted to see the picture of the Ferraris I, I, I drove and stuff like that. So, but I, I remember going, we should definitely fight. At some stage, we should definitely fight. You've got a height <laughs> advantage. <laughs> and, you know, and I was probably being a pain in the hole after a while, but he, you could see he was okay with that level of, like, I not one mention of comedy, you know, there was not, not that I was even conscious. I just, I actually didn't give a fuck at that stage. Cause I'd seen some amazing comedians anyway. So I was like, ah, whatever, Bill, you're whinging about them. Yeah, did, you knows stop whinging about, did you stop whinging about the fucking door? And he was like, Oh, I said, you're the only comedian here who get away with whinging about the fucking door being open for the love of fuck, man. Let us, <laughs> I said, let us have one sunny day in the whole fucking year. Will you? We're trying to appreciate it here. You're not that special. And he was, <laughs> he was but he came on, we went over to Whelan's afterwards. Um, I think he dipped out after a while. Um, well, yeah, I said, he, I, I, would he now be spotted like in Dublin now when you were out with him? Were no, there... no. Really? No, no. He's just a fucking skinny, bald white man. Like, you know what I mean? Nobody, no. But he, he, sold, he came to Ireland and sold out the three arena. Man. Yeah, but people probably came from Galway to see him as yeah. well as Cork. You know what I mean? Three arenas, nothing. Like in, you know, like... He, it, I don't say it's nothing, but you know what I mean? He does have that fan base now, but it's it's a handful of Vicar Streets, like, you know, like Tommy Turner would get spotted much quicker. Oh, and in Ireland. You yeah. know what I mean? Like, this is, so I don't, I don't like, you know, it was, it was nighttime too. It was busy. Nobody, now the entire horde that was walking over was coming from the festival anyway. And they were heading to Whelan's because, you know, that upstairs bit in Whelan's. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Kinda, the living room bit. of piss and is always sticky. They've cleaned it up. They, they've cleaned it up oh, wait, in sorry, recent time. Sorry, the bar, the the lounge upstairs. Yeah, it looks like oh, a yeah, kind of a nineteen forties sitting room, yeah, Nana yeah. sitting room. Yeah, the area. Oh, is that what that is? All right. All I know is that they, they know how to charge for a drink up or anything. But I was fairly full. I probably you shouldn't. Need be. like you need like the purple, yellow, green, and pink wristband. I think to get up. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But DeRosa, we stayed on it, and I think bar tipped away. He probably wasn't up to speed with the sauce too, like because at that stage Are you we were. Still in touch then? Did you stay in touch with DeRosa since or no? The odd text every so often, yeah. The odd text, and we're still, you know, we follow each other on social media. But I mean, but that's a blo- blokes don't, don't blokes don't fucking go hanging out with each other either. And we don't, you know, I don't text anybody. Like whatever. Has you he know. done the show? No, I must actually have him on. It's just it's good. Actually, you should get him. We spoke. We we spoke, and he was like, "Absolutely, let's fucking do it." Just never. That's how uh, I'm making friends in New York, man. Through the podcast. Yeah, I'm like. All my friends are comedians in New York. Who yeah, I, my podcast. <laughs> yeah, comedians are grand and all the rest of it. Like, you know, they're grand. But there's other interesting people out there too. Like, you know what I mean? So tell us more. Like, tell us more. Um, we haven't spoken about fucking Appella at all. Oh, yeah. Well, you see, what was, so we did I, episode four of... It was back in the early 50s. Anyway, we did it when we recorded on a wax spool, I believe. And yeah. got it. We recorded it into two spoons and uh, it was fun, actually, because it was upstairs in the International Comedy Club in Dublin and it was in the middle of the day and we had biscuits. Yeah. I remember. And I think it was actually 
yeah, it was kind of when podcasts were re-emerging in Ireland, and mm. like I was very excited to be just doing be, to be on one. Um, so I don't know what AJ was then. So the whole thing with Appella was, I wanted to record an album in full before I turned thirty, and that was like seventeen years ago. But I did it, man. I fucking did. I recorded it. I produced it. Finished it. And uh, I had four singles out there, but I, I, it stayed on my phone for two years. Jesus. And as I said, you know, getting wiser with age and all that shit. I kind of realized, oh, fuck, I'm afraid of failure. I'm afraid of, ah. I, I released this album and I don't immediately become Brandon Flowers and the Killers. <laughs> I've wasted my 20s. You know? So just look at your portfolio book. You haven't wasted your twenties. You're a oh man. Go, you go really well on the side of a bus. It's fucking like it's all a facade. And I've spoken about this many times on many pods. Is um, when you're highly insecure, you need to develop a facade and a shell. When you're an Irish man, and you're getting WhatsApps from your friends going, "What the fuck are you doing?" You know, you need to have a brashness about you. And in a way, I like that. Equally, I like mental health and the normalization of mental health. And I've done this on my podcast. And this is a slight side. This is a yeah, slight, yeah, yeah. Side aside for a moment. Um, like the podcast that I have, and I coined this phrase, and I fucking love the phrase. My girlfriend doesn't like it, but I fucking love it. Because the starting my podcast, I was like, what is what is it? another straight white man doing a podcast just what the world needs so uh it was going to be sort of a comedy podcast at the beginning but as it evolves i noticed well people are just really opening up here and talking right yeah 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 like and people have there's been three or four episodes where people have shared so much that i would get a text like I got a text from Dougie from McFly after the episode. Stop. Because he was talking about rehab and he was like, hey man, and like the next day I just been thinking about that rehab stuff. You know, I don't really he was worried that it would go into the ink the British press. Okay. Which I completely understand. And I was like like I was like, hey firstly man you spoke so eloquently about it. All the context was there. It was 14 minutes of an hour and a half podcast. I'm going to send you the audio. Like, I'm not, I don't want to, the whole point is to not sensationalize anything. And the fact that you are talking about it is normalizing it because you're not the fucking guy who went to rehab. I had Justine Stafford on, who's an Irish female comic. Yeah. Tried to take her life two times before she got diagnosed with borderline personality disorder. And it was only when she got diagnosed when she realized that she, like, she wasn't alone in the world. And she shared that whole story. Now, obviously, navigating that space from doing radio, I know that I need to. I'm not a mental health professional. Yes. Yeah, so yeah. I need, I'm not giving this like I ensure that this is a story. This is a version of events. This does not solve your problem. Your only way to solve your problem is by picking up that phone, which is the bravest thing you'll ever do and calling a therapist or going to get help. And then when the first guy you don't you go and see you don't get on him you have to go to a second it's if it's challenging, that's bravery, but she told her story, in graphic detail very openly, but she's not known as the girl ah there's your one who tried to commit commit or I don't think you can say commit suicide take her own life whatever mm. fuck PC bastards, um, you know and then I've had fucking comics on you know talking about like like their vaginas and fucking you know lesbianism <laughs> that i think i don't know so the podcast kind of it was like there was all this serious shit going on and i loved the the steve garrigan coming on telling me about his panic attacks and then moving on to talking about other stuff that he's not defined yes yeah 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 by the thing because a little part of my brain worries about these problem professionals that, you know, you got the thing, then you make your thing, then it's your brand, then you have a podcast, then you have Zoom classes, and then you have a book and a fucking audio tape, and then a fucking VHS tape, and then a DVD, and you're making all this money off it or whatever, and then that becomes you. What about the person who doesn't want to become, what about the person who has depression that doesn't know they have depression, 
and is worried that if they get diagnosed, it's all they're going to become. Yeah, yeah. Well, just, that's the whole reason why I didn't make a team of this podcast. It's just fucking Tom O'Mahony because I just go, what fucking team could I go with? And I know for people who don't fully know me, like in the comedy world and stuff like that, they're going, but you're just a fella that goes out and fucking smashes animals in the face with a fucking hammer. I'm like, actually, <laughs> motherfucker. Actually, motherfucker, it's a lot more ethical. That, and, and to be honest, maybe four or five times in a year I get to do it. That's at most, you know, but the... Because fuck it, it's everywhere, and I've I've talked openly on on my podcast too. Like I've I I went straight into a fucking mountain, like at the the last fucking crash. You know what I mean? How I ended up in fucking comedy and all the rest. Of it. And if anybody ever wants, but I always stayed at the top because there's a couple of fucking podcasters out there that never make the clarification at the top that they sure as shit are not a fucking professional. And I always say, if you need me to talk, to, if you're you know immediately, that's the starting point write me an email but i can tell you here now you need to seek a professional of course because you need to seek a professional to fix your fucking car do of you know course what i mean you do but my point is 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 that i um with the people who have opened up and shared some fucking heavy shit on the show like i uh, i i it's i don't know it's like i want it to be as like not to say it's not serious because it is but i want it to normalize it the way you were talking about fucking shooting cattle or whatever it is. Yeah. It's just life is complicated, right? And that's it. Life is complicated. And the older you get, the more complicated it becomes and you got to adjust and adapt. And it's, uh, you don't have to be defined by certain things. So that's what I'm with any sort of discussion of mental health on my show. That's my objective is to, and I've gotten emails from people who've been like, Oh, I never knew that about that person. I felt the same way. Th thanks for sharing the story and that's like all the people haven't become the thing that they're talking of course about. they haven't like justine is one of the funniest people i know like she's her ability to turn out she's the, as i titled her when she was on my show the queen of meme like she just turns oh, out yeah. some of the best strongest strong strong comedy like online I like don't crack i don't know her only know her from the pod like you know we can't meet because i did mm -hmm. um Anyway, so the, the phrase that I'm trying to get to here is the podcast, and you'll love this because I love alliteration. Dark world is different, blah, 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 New York, blah, blah, blah. With room for silly and sincere to exist in serendipity. Oh, my goodness. Because that's what it is, man. Yeah. We can have a fucking silly goose time or a serious goose time. Either yeah. way, you're going to be entertained, informed, or engaged. And that's what it's all fucking about. And um, there's no, you are so brave. You are so brave. It's just, yeah. Oh, what happened? Holy shit. You know, that's, tell us more. Really? Yeah. Oh God. You had an eating disorder? What, what? What's that like? I don't know about eating disorders. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Joanne McNally, tell us what happened. That's very graphic. Uh, that's really, it's a, it's a really dangerous thing to have. Tell us how dangerous it is. And, and, Oh, getting diagnosed and getting help was your solution? Great. The person listening might go, oh, fuck. Okay, so there's an answer. There's a fucking solution, man, for every problem. Oh, yeah, there is. But I think what, what I'm picking up on what you're saying is that, yeah, similarly, I mean, mine would probably, I suppose this probably comes out of some, because I've spoken to, to people who aren't comedians and stuff like that or don't even have comedically, aren't comedically driven. But um, the exact same thing, conversational, like, because again, you you don't want to be defined as that kind of a podcast. It's just, uh, well, uh, well, let's go through the, so I like to ask everybody, what are our top three, you know, whereas you let the, let the reins off. And I find people let the reins off. What I find an awful lot, I get, I get off people afterwards when I get messages from people going, Jesus Christ, I didn't know that. I just didn't know that person would cut loose like that. You know, one person or another to go, yeah, because you had them, they were in whatever head or whatever role they were in before that. You had them boxed off as being that. And that's what people do. It's easier to box people off. But then all of a sudden they're on my show and they may be from a sports background, but then they're talking about, like you said, mental health. And then they're going straight into, but you know what I would have loved to be? A fucking singer. I can't really sing, but you know. Exactly. And I think that's, I, I think that's true normalizing personally. What I'm saying is we're markers. That's, I'm so glad you said it. And we're going to start in the country music band after this. I don't know if you know that, but myself and Dara are, uh, country music aficionados and that's where we're going because that's where the big I money is that was what Hugh Cooney told me it's gonna what? come back after COVID oh it never went away it's just no, went on underground 
line dancing, social distancing, line dancing. Anyway, your initial question was a pedal, so I'll finish that. Uh, I told you that was an aside. Um, it was afraid of, I was afraid of failure, and um, uh, uh, I just decided uh, I, we were coming back to Ireland for a couple of months, and uh, I kind of like to use time well. Yes. So, like the pandemic happened in New York and it was very tragic and a lot of New Yorkers died. There were 16,000 cases a day at one point. Ooh. Um, and, you know, that's the big picture. So what can I do for the big picture? Stay the fuck inside and wear my mask. So that's what I did. Now, what am I going to do here? Watch news and Twitter and panic and think myself into a hole or be grateful for the world being on pause that we all secretly have fantasized about driving home from a show or work yeah. or whatever you're doing. If I could just have 24 hours where I could just be in fucking bed, that's all I need. 20. And then, and then God, God, our father fucking seven months we got or whatever. I don't know how fucking long we're into the pandemic six years. Who knows? I was like, holy shit, a pause. I've moved to a new country. Sure, work options are limited now and I can't get a meeting and iHeartMedia is shutting down and Viacom is closed until fucking 2057. But New York is quiet. I have a picture of me standing at like 42nd and Broadway in the middle of Times Square on what? my own. Just in what? the middle of the road. In the middle of the day, like? There's nobody in Manhattan, man. It's a fucking ghost town. Unreal. Amazing, Jesus. Amazing to see. Then Black Lives Matter happens and then uh, there's big protests. So I'm like, this is a huge movement. I have no idea what it's like to be black. Um, my, my friend Terry Thomas is a comedian at The Cellar. He came on the podcast. I was very unsure about doing it. Um, and I was like, hey, man, like, fucking hell, you're going to be my first black guest and you're talking about Black Lives Matter. Is this a bit... Terry's cool. He came on the podcast. He sort of explained what it's like to be a black man in America. And I don't know. And I thought it was funny looking at Irish Twitter going black lives matter. It, and I'm like, Ireland is a different country. Things are very different. <laughs> Things are very different there. Just because it's on Twitter and celebrities are doing it doesn't mean you have to do it too, but support the movement. So, uh, I just shut the fuck up and I, li I talked to Terry and I asked him questions and he told me very interesting things like things his dad told him, like, get this. When he was a teenager, his dad told him this. This is the protocol. When you're getting pulled over by the police, you're going to see the lights flashing. Keep driving. Never pull over in a dark road. Pull over in light. Call somebody on your cell phone. Put your cell phone on the seat. Leave it on speakerphone. Pull in in a well-lit area. Roll all four windows down. All four windows down. You don't want the officer saying you, that they can't see inside the vehicle. Keep your license and in, um, your insurance in your visor. So your hands are on your steering wheel. And when you're, when you're reaching for your license, you're reaching up. You're not reaching to a place with the officer. And this had to be like instilled hell. in his brain from a kid so he wouldn't get shot by a police officer. Now, the NYPD are fucking amazing. They're fucking unreal. I've, I've had to call 911 a couple of times because of shit I've seen. And they're there within 90 seconds, man. They, the response rate is incredible. There are great police officers. And for the most part, they mean well. Is it a few bad apples? We're not getting into the racist debate over here because we're two white men. However, hearing this from fucking Terry, I think about getting pulled over by a guard in Ireland and being like, what's the crack? Nah, just heading home. Yeah, no, just heading home from work. Or if you get a ticket, you go, ah, me mate's a guard. Well, you take that off the system there. Like, it's just fucking, it's, we yeah. can't, we don't understand. Man. I guess, I guess either side of that coin too is the a, a guard in Ireland has n absolutely no fear that we have a weapon down the side. No, they don't. No. And we have no fear that he has a weapon or a sidearm. You know what I mean? We don't understand it, man. And, and, no. and that's what I accepted. And I went into the, um, <laughs> I was going to say parades. <laughs> protest i love how you i love if you thought it was a parade and you brought like you brought your baton your baton he's got a black lives matter dara it's not like that and man i i never had been to a protest in my life because like i remember being on the radio and people i was protesting like fuck who has the energy who has the energy or time so i went in and with my camera uh and i took some amazing photos and videos but like I swear to God, this sounds really lame. 
the fucking energy of 7,000 people marching up 4th Avenue in Manhattan with like their, their different chants. It was like, you could feel it. Like it was really, really strange. Right. Like, like I didn't expect to be like, it was kind of emotional. I get a thing that does not affect me whatsoever. I was like, Oh my God, you have empathy for other human beings. Um, so I went in. What, what is this feeling in my chest right now? Oh, it's, it's empathy. I was a sociopath. God damn it. <laughs> so it was incredible. The power. And I sp speaking to Terry about this, I saw no violence from the police in New York City. I saw no violence from the protesters towards the police. Sure, there were aggressive chanting and drums. And I heard some guy, he had a rolling PA system. With, with a fucking thing going, fuck Donald Trump, fuck Donald Trump. And then everyone is like, fuck Donald Trump. Like it was fucking crazy. <laughs> it was only at nighttime it kicked off. And what it was was people taking advantage. Of course. Yeah. You know, and there was 10 nights of fucking chaos in New York City. Uh, I live in Brooklyn. So down by the uh, East River, I go, uh, I had downloaded the, at this app called Five O, where you can listen to the police scanner. Stop. Stop by the river, man. Listening to the police radio scanner. That'll the... do your anxiety fucking loads. Oh loads. man, again, I'm okay in in chaos. Okay, right. It's when it's not. not... <laughs> I'm it's okay when... with chaos. I've learned uh, there has been events in my life in the last two years that have turned my world upside down that I'm going to talk about in 2021. I can't talk about it now. Yeah. But I have learned that I can, I'm fine in chaos and a crisis. But I'm not okay if you send me a DM saying, hey, man, didn't really appreciate what you said to me on the podcast there. I think that I'm fucking off. That's it. Right the week off, baby. I'm panicking. I'm, I'm, I'm crying. I'm vomiting. I'm, I, I, I'm, I can't keep down solids. So it's interesting. I've learned that about myself. Like there was a shooting outside my apartment at 1.30 a.m., 25 rounds, a gang shooting. Jesus. No adrenaline rush. Huh? Yeah, I was. It was w weirdly okay. I'm like nine one one, total snitch. Fuck them! Don't be shooting guns in the neighborhood, you piece of shit. Get out of here! I'm like I'm nine one one. I'm like looking at the license plate. I'm like Charlie Juliet six, <laughs> November seven seven, heading west towards Williamsburg Bridge. <laughs> like fucking calm as a cucumber. It's very very strange. I'd never experienced a shooting before. And then, like, I'm down talking to the detectives. It was like a scene out of fucking... It was kind of like watching Grand Theft Auto from the third floor of my apartment. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what it was like with all the cops with their things, like counting shell cases. So, um, like, I was down by the river, and I'm watching, like, this fucking chaos in Manhattan. Five choppers listening to the police scanner, listening to them saying, like, we got uh, 4,000, 5,000. Uh, heading east on the Brooklyn Bridge and then the, like you see then the chopper moving down towards the bridge man it was fucking fascinating there's the 8pm curfew it was uh, it was like and I moved to New York a lot as for personal growth and I got that baby in the fucking fast lane in Jesus did you what you know you're what not I mean? gonna like, see, you're not gonna get that in fucking Terra New York or where have you <laughs> <laughs> so uh so there was all that going on. And in amongst this time, I was like, the pandemic happened. And, I, and then I revisited the album. Yeah. Uh, 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 a producer friend of mine, I'm really lucky. Uh, Aiden Cunningham is his name, moved to Brooklyn as well. Uh, him and his girlfriend live um, like a couple of miles away. And he has a studio in his basement. And he's a full-time mixing engineer, audio genius. So we went back at the album and remastered it. And it was like, oh, these are great songs. Yeah. So then... Um, we decided to come back for Ireland for a couple of months. And I was like, I'm just going to pull the trigger on this now. Fuck it. Yeah. Even though my publicist is like, no, it's Christmas. Terrible time to release. I'm like, we're doing it. So it's, I released a new single on December 11th, which is a while ago now, but it's still up there on the YouTubes. If you search. That's, is that point, point of view? Is that that one? Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. Uh, and that has like real strings and everything. I got to record a real string section, which is a big deal. And then the album is 1963, which comes out on January um 29th 
Uh, when is this podcast episode coming out is my question to you. I'm gonna, this is going to be going out uh, since Stephen's Day. Okay. So I can't say what I'm doing yet, but I'm doing something very important with this record um, uh, for the benefit of other people. Because all I want out of the album, it was actually Mark Normand, the comedian who kind of said this. It was two people, Mark Normand and a guy called John Bro, who's in um, Roshino and John Bro. Uh, thank brother. Yes. Brother. Uh, he, he's a, he directed the Coronas live at the Olympia. He's so fucking talented. He was in a band called Miracle Bell and he never released the Miracle Bell album and he regretted it. And then Mark Normand was talking about the catalog and he was like, Mark Norman is a comedian from New York who's been putting up all these videos of himself bombing and stinking at these New York Park comedy shows, which I've been to, man. They're fucking awkward. And he's like embracing how shit comedy's gotten in yeah. the pandemic and he's using it and he's growing audience. And he's like, the reason he said yes to my podcast was because he was like, these are all fucking the gym, man. I do all. Yeah, of course. Yeah, I'm yeah. So when I get a Rogan, I'm fucking ready to go, you know? And he was like, life is a catalog. Just keep putting shit in the catalog, you know? And I'm like, fuck, man. I just need this Appella album to exist in the catalog. Yeah, absolutely. My expectation with this album is that it exists. That's all I want. Beautiful. So there, It exists, man. It'll be there forever. That's it. And when do we know what the, what the, the purpose of the album is then? When, when can we know? Uh, I believe January 7th. January 7th. Uh, I can't say it now because it's this sounds and I hate this shit, right? Don, hate... it's, you're contractually obliged not to fucking say it. So it's not even like your big news coming, guys. It's just the I, <laughs> it's terms and conditions need to be clearly ironed out. And it's a very important reason I'm doing it. And uh, I, I have to have that yeah. exactly in place. Um, before I can say what it is, because all I wanted is all I want is the record to exist. That's it, and I'm um, I'm going to be able to do something with it for other people. Okay, that's. I'm good. not going to make the money back in the fucking album, man. The thing yeah. cost me thirty grand to make. <laughs> I'm not going to take that back from Spotify. Spring. Out of here. You earn your whole yeah. You the, know, um... It's a good fucking album as well. Like, if you for anybody who's wondering, like. Like you will have come across it, I guarantee at some stage. But I'm gonna put, uh, I'm gonna put the link probably to it was Spotify link in the bottom, so you can go through the 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 entirety of it. But I will yeah, obviously be following. There are songs out there on Spotify and Apple Music, and there, are, like every song is a music video as well, because I'm a weirdo and everything has to be perfect. So like it's uh, like the videos are great. The video there was one was a city limits that that told it that a bunch oh, of people. Also, yeah, that was directed by Andrew Houlihan and uh, the two actors in that video, Chris Newman and uh, Essie Woods. I think Newman was in Red Rock or something. Handsome guy. Right? Yeah, yeah, big handsome fella. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's very, it's great, but it tells a great story where you could absolutely buy into it. Like it's that's a take of the social influencer. Like yeah, it, it's beautiful. It's a really stupid video, like really over the top. Like even there's a bit in the video where he falls off a chair and the, the fall is terrible. <laughs> like, yeah, you know, uh, and they're like, yeah, but this is the great thing about Ireland, man. There are these people who are willing to collaborate when I have no fucking money. You wouldn't get that in New York, man. To do City Limits, the video in New York is $25,000. Jesus for, Christ. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, no, I get you. I get you. We'll... uh yeah, that was fantastic. That was beautiful, beautiful hanging out. I wish we could hang out longer, but I do have. Would you believe it? Out of all the fucking strange things I have right now, what I have I have to go get tires on my car, and this is the only time pre fucking the new year. And if all four tires are bald as shit, and in the next hour is the only time this guy can put tires on a fucking bullet because this is very enjoyable. I have nothing else on. I have nothing. I've finished all my on or like. Is it an NCT or you got to get the tires? No, the NCT, they just about passed the NCT, but the guy was like, dude, I'm going to pass this because I the car. See, this is a fucking thing. People bring their NCT, their car in for the NCT. Go, I don't know. I fell this so quickly. It's because like women that were in front of me, there was this one woman that was in front of me and that dude, and they didn't have the boot empty. The car was all covered in shit. These guys don't want to be under oh, that. Have the car. The caps off, baby. Take the caps off. Have baby. the car immaculate. The guy left me off, but I know it. I know it. we're going to get snow here at some stage and I'll be driving around with I'm fucking eggs. And this is the only time. And I'm fucking raging because 
I did a bunch of corporate gigs, a fucking shit ton of them in the last fortnight. What, what are you driving? Oh, it's just a fucking Opel Insignia. I'm not driving. Well, I'm Mr. Daddy now. I drive. I don't drive anything fast anymore. I'm vintage, baby. I came back from New York. I needed a car. I got a, a 06 Ford Estate for 600 euro. That's what, yeah, that's what you need. And this is the great thing about Ireland is you have a guy for a thing. Uh, you always have a guy for a thing. Like yeah. you have a guy for your tires and you don't have that in New York. And I had my lad, you know, Arthur. He's a fucking mechanic who's, you know, 79. And I was, Hello? Arthur, it's Dar- Hello? Dara Quilty. <laughs> Come here. I was like, do you have anything on the yard? Hello? Arthur. <laughs> anyway, he's great. And I, he's like, I have a Ford there, 600 lids. I was like, grand, I'll take him when I get back. And just That's- the fact that you can do that in Ireland. Yeah. Like, the thing is fantastic. Of course it is. And it'll be worth, it'll be worth 600 lids in five years' time as well. I, can be oh, yeah. well, I want to sell it when I move back to New York. So uh, if anyone is interested in a 06 Ford estate, Owned by Dara Quilty. <laughs> oh, beautiful! This oh, has been a, me on, this has really been a joy. I'm gonna. I'm actually gonna play out this with. I feel so radioy now, being able to say that I'm gonna play this out. I'm gonna because you are gonna send me the file of uh, you. Are you song in? Oh, absolutely! I'm gonna oh, put yeah. the song in. So we're gonna close it out instead of my theme, the usual old theme tune. I'm gonna stick a uh, point of view at the very end of this. Um, go look at the video. Your video is so intensely fun. You look like you're really enjoying. Very, very COVID, isn't it? Very COVID. Yeah, very. Man, literally me, uh, Andrew Houlihan again directing, Peter Cooney DOP and Stephanie Williams on makeup. Just four of us in a room, all socially distanced. And it's just literally me in a white room. <laughs> now, this is the thing. As an artist, <laughs> I feel like it's reflective of the year and how lonely we've all been. And as a human being, it was all like a pull out of the fucking bag before the signal came out. So, you know. <laughs> but it's really beautifully shot. Because the it- guys that were shooting it knew, like it was shot in some black magic and they were talking about lenses. I think- yeah. I don't understand it, but I know what I like, and I liked it. So this is what I need you to do, Thomas. We're, we're going to close this out now, and you're going mm-hmm. to... This is my only request. You're going to introduce my song in a calm manner, but you must get the artist, uh, the song title, and the podcast title, and then you've got to hit the vocal of, of, me, of me singing. That's all. Oh, my God. Can you do that? Are you ready? What your 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 podcast is different, is it? No, no, your podcast. Oh, my! Why my podcast? Because you're playing the fucking song. Yeah, but everybody, if people are already listening to the podcast. Yeah, but you're gonna this. You're gonna put the song in now in a minute, right? Yeah. So what I need you to do, (laughs) I need you to introduce the song, and say, like, I need you to do your partridge here, and I need you to introduce the song, say the song title, and. Like finish on your podcast title, but the podcast title has to hit the vocal of the song. Like, oh my ready. goodness! Are you ready, Tom? So I, I, I think I'm ready. Okay, I, I, I'll take it through it. Right. So your name is uh, Tom O'Mani. Your podcast is Bookshot. And um, my band, Appella. And the song, Point of View. So it'll be something like this. Thank you very much, Dara Quilty. I'm Tom O'Mani. This is. Oh, oh yeah, sorry. No, no. See, I'm even nervous. Now. <clears throat> sorry. Thank you very much, Derek Wilty, for an insightful interview. And now to close out the show, this is Appella Point of View on Tom O'Mahony's bookshot. <laughs> you've then, just done it. I'm not fucking doing it. You do. You've got to do that, and you've got to get then. You've got to <laughs> time it out just so. And then I start singing when you finish talking. I I believe in you. Here we go. Here we go. In three, two. Thank you very much, Derek Wilty. That has been a special experience. So coming up, guys, we are very, very happy to have, of course, Appella's point of view. I've been Tom O'Mahi. This has been Buckshot. <laughs> <laughs> From the moment that I met you, I was idolizing someone new, maybe that's you. 
From the moment that I met you, I fantasized about the future too. Maybe with you. I knew that it had a bitter end.